Well, all right, as folks are joining us, I will just um, remind everybody that they're free um, to put in their questions in the chat while our presenter um, is presenting and then we'll moderate that and they can be answered at the end. Um, but I will be brief and let uh, Dr. Glennie introduce um, our, our Butler Memorial Lecture. Hey, thanks so much and good afternoon and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds and this year's John Butler Memorial Lecture. Uh, before I turn over the Zoom controls to Vashesh Kapoor to introduce this year's lecture, I thought I'd give you just a little background on who John Butler was and why it is that we have a lecture named after him. So John Butler, or JB, as everyone knew him, uh, began his medical education in Birmingham, England, where he studied lung mechanics. He then came over to the uh, Cardiovascular Research Institute at UCSF, where he worked with Julius Comro. He was then recruited up to the University of Washington in 1965 to become the head of a new subspecialty, uh, respiratory diseases at the University of Washington. Uh, JB had a vision for this new subspecialty that included scientific research along with clinical excellence and I think he deserves much of the credit for the division and who we are today. Um, posted on the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Round website, there's a brochure where you can read more about JB and all the lecturers we've had in the past. In 2017, we added sleep to our division name to recognize the clinical care, the research, and the training programs that we conducted in sleep medicine within the division. The growth of sleep medicine at the University of Washington uh, has been led by Vashesh Kapoor, who founded the first sleep medicine center at Harborview Medical Center in 1999. And Vashesh now leads uh, seven faculty members, a uh, clinical training program across the University of Washington Medical Center, the VA Medical Center, um, as well as um, Harborview Medical Center. And I've asked Vashesh as the director of our sleep medicine program to introduce this year's John Butler lecturer, Sanjay Patel, who's a national leader in sleep medicine. Vashesh? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to introduce Dr. Sanjay Patel, who I consider as one of the great minds in sleep medicine epidemiology as the John Butler Memorial Lecture Speaker. Uh, Dr. Patel is Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology, and Clinical and Translational Science at University of Pittsburgh, where he directs the Center for Sleep and Cardiovascular Outcomes Research. He also is the Medical Director of the Comprehensive Sleep Disorders Program there. Dr. Patel has an impressive academic pedigree, having completed his MD at Harvard, uh, completed a internal medicine residency at the University of Pennsylvania, and then returned to Harvard to complete a Plummer Critical Care Fellowship, as well as a Master of Science in Epidemiology. Dr. Patel is internationally recognized as an expert on the epidemiology of sleep disorders. His research has focused on chronic partial sleep deprivation and obstructive sleep apnea and their effects on metabolism. We have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Patel speak today on the topic of the diagnosis and management of obstructive sleep apnea. So without delay, I hand you over to him. Um, thank you so much, Vishesh. It's really um, an honor to get to speak in this forum and especially um, to give a lecture named in honor of Dr. Butler. Um, as, as I thought about a topic for, for today's talk, I, I really thought that um, what would maybe be the most relevant for an internal medicine uh, audience would be really talking about some of the transformational research that's occurred over the last five to 10 years on how to take care of this disease of obstructive sleep apnea that um, it is very common, but unfortunately is, is um, sort of has historically been kind of a boutique um, disease. And so uh, um, I hope I can try to convince you that, that we now have the methods to try to be much more um, precise in, in, in providing care to the right patient. So, um, briefly, just my conflicts of interest you should be aware of. I have received grant support um, through my institution from, from the uh, companies listed there. 
So I, I thought I'd start with just a couple of cases. Um, the first case is a 48 year old man with gastroesophageal reflux and some arthritis, a BMI of 32. Um, he works in the IT industry and he's beta testing an app. Um, and so he presents because this app on his Apple watch has told him he stops breathing 25 times an hour. His ex-wife has told him that he snored, but he himself reports that he has good sleep quality and no daytime sleepiness. However, he's a little bit worried because he has a family history of premature coronary artery disease and, and he's read that sleep apnea can cause heart disease. Um, the second case is a 55 year old woman with hypertension, type two diabetes, a BMI of 34, who presents with low back pain. On history, it becomes clear the pain began after she, she rear-ended another car driving home from work. And so we'll come back to these cases at the end of the presentation, but, but I hope you can keep them in your mind. So I, I think probably most of this audience will, will be aware of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And so it's a syndrome characterized by repetitive episodes of upper airway obstruction during sleep. So as we try to breathe, our diaphragms contract and create a negative uh, inspiratory force that generates negative pressure in the chest that's transmitted to the upper airway. And that negative pressure during sleep when muscle tone in the upper airway dilator muscles is, is diminished, uh, tends to cause a collapsing uh, force on the airway. And so as you can see in the schematic, the soft palate and the tongue can fall backwards and obstruct the airway. In, in order to, um, reopen the airway, the individual has to wake up from sleep for, for a few seconds. And that um, then reestablishes uh, muscle tone in the airway uh, to pull these structures out open. But if these, ep these episodes of obstruction are happening repetitively through the night, they can cause nocturnal awakenings and daytime sleepiness. So the apnea hypopnea index, the AHI is the most common metric we use to define sleep apnea severity. And just to define things, an apnea in adults is defined as air, no airflow for 10 seconds or longer, while a hypopnea is a decrement in airflow for longer than 10 seconds. Um, to try to distinguish sort of a pathologic hypopnea from just normal physiologic variability, we typically want to see some physiologic uh, measure that shows that the hypopnea is significant. And so typically we require either a fallen oxygen saturation or an arousal. Now, over the course of the night, if you add up all the apneas and hypopneas, divide by the hours of sleep, you get this AHI metric. And traditionally, we think of an AHI less than five events per hour as normal, five to 15 mild sleep apnea, 15 to 30 moderate, and greater than 30 events per hour as severe sleep apnea. So when we go from the AHI to obstructive sleep apnea, basically the traditional definition of obstructive sleep apnea is an AHI greater than or equal to five events per hour with evidence that those obstructions are, are, with those respiratory events are happening because of an obstructive physiology where the airway is collapsing. Um, it's important, I think, to distinguish obstructive sleep apnea from obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, where not only do you have that physiology, but you also have characteristic symptoms that the patient's concerned about, such as bothersome snoring or excessive daytime sleepiness. So um, we, we've published uh, data over the last year estimating the worldwide prevalence of sleep apnea and using an AHI greater than or equal to five, we estimated the prevalence is nearly a billion people in the world. And even if we limit it to moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, we're really talking about um, 400 million people. And you can see on those maps that the, the, the prevalence is very widely from country to country, primarily driven by differences in age and BMI. In the United States, we, we have um, a lot of epidemiologic work to try to uh, give better estimates of the prevalence. And you can see that um, for obstructive sleep apnea, the prevalence in men is 34% and in women 17%. So, so really high prevalence is among middle-aged uh, populations. If we limit it to the sleep apnea syndrome, so requiring um, some symptoms, and here that's operationalized by excessive daytime sleepiness, you can still see that it's fairly common still with 14% of men and 5% and of women affected. So I, I've mentioned several times that obstructive sleep apnea causes excessive daytime sleepiness, which can certainly impact quality of life. But in addition, it's important to recognize that it can also cause uh, motor vehicle crashes. And so this is a case control study from uh, 20 years ago where the investigators uh, studied with sleep studies, uh, patients who presented to the emergency room as drivers in a motor vehicle crash and then as controls used uh, other patients who presented to the same emergency rooms. And what they found was that the odds of, uh, of having sleep apnea if you'd been the driver in a motor vehicle crash were 11 fold greater in adjusted analyses. 
Um, one of the other things that has been concerning about obstructive sleep apnea and its long-term health consequences is based on this work from Vern Summers at the Mayo Clinic over 25 years ago now, where he, he measured using EMG electrodes in the perineal nerve sympathetic tone. And what he found was if you look at the second channel, the, the, which shows breathing, that whenever the breathing uh, ceased due to a, an apneic episode, there was a burst of sympathetic activity that steadily increased over the course of the apnea and then resolved once breathing returned back to normal. And that increased sympathetic tone was associated with surges in blood pressure through the night. And in fact, his lab has shown that if you look at these patients the next day when they're wide awake, patients with obstructive sleep apnea have higher resting sympathetic tone compared to controls. And if you treat the sleep apnea, that elevated sympathetic tone goes away. Um, and so there's been a lot of concern that this elevated sympathetic tone can contribute not only to hypertension, but cardiovascular disease as well. Now, the most common treatment for sleep apnea, most of you are going to be aware, is continuous positive airway pressure. And this is a picture of a patient using a, a CPAP machine. And it's, it basically consists of a, a device that blows air um, through a hose into a mask. And basically the, the point is to try to generate enough flow that the pressure in the airway is positive so that the airway won't collapse when the person breathes around this. In terms of the uh, pros and cons of CPAP therapy, I think the big advantage of CPAP therapy is that it normalizes breathing during sleep immediately. It's highly efficacious in resolving the physiologic abnormalities that we see in sleep apnea. Um, the other advantage is that it really has no lasting side effects. If you stop using a CPAP, any side effects will go away. Um, Nevertheless, there are some disadvantages. It certainly can disrupt sleep. You can have claustrophobia from having a mask on your face. Um, and the uh, getting used to breathing with the CPAP mask on can be disruptive, particularly in the first week or so. In, in addition, there are important psychological effects. It labels the individual as sick. It's much harder to hide the CPAP machine. Every time a patient goes into their bedroom, they see that machine and are reminded of the disease. And also family members can also see it and know that the patient has a condition. It's much harder to hide, it's much harder to hide a CPAP machine than, than a pill bottle. Um, it's also psychologically unappealing. Uh, a lot of studies have shown one of the major barriers to uh, accepting CPAP therapy is patients worrying about what their partner will think of them and whether they'll find them unattractive. And then like all chronic medical therapies, um, effective outcomes from CPAP really require sustained motivation since it's a treatment and not a cure. Nevertheless, there's been a lot of sort of nihilism about CPAP saying nobody's going to ever use this. So what's the point in, in even trying? And so these are data that, that we've published recently where we've used a national data, data set taking um, all the patients started on CPAP from one of the major CPAP manufacturers. And so this is over 750,000 people initiated on CPAP over three years. And we found that overall adherence at 90 days was fairly high at 73%. And this matches uh, almost exactly the adherence reported from a national database from uh, the other leading CPAP manufacturer. And so three quarters of patients are using their CPAP. And so we shouldn't be nihilistic that this is not gonna be something that's accepted. But what we also found is that there's major differences by demographics in CPAP adherence. So the traditional stereotypical patient, a 60 or 70 year old male um, with sleep apnea has adherence rates of, of over 80%. But as we get to younger age groups, you can see adherence drops considerably. And then across all age groups, we find that women do much worse with adherence to CPAP. And when we look at young women under the age of 30, you can see that adherence rates are only about 50%. And so I think moving forward, in order to uh, maximize the benefits from CPAP therapy, we really need to address the, the issues that are specific to these uh, younger populations as well as women. In any case, there, there's a lot of data uh, showing that CPAP uh, improves sleepiness. I think this is probably the one thing we know about treating sleep apnea. These are, these are meta-analyses um, looking at randomized trials of CPAP or control, showing that there's large clinically important improvements in sleepiness if you treat a sleepy patient uh, with sleep, sleep apnea uh, with CPAP therapy, both as assessed using self-reported measures with the upward sleepiness scale as well as objective measures in, measured in the sleep lab. In addition, there's been a lot of trials looking at the impact of CPAP on blood pressure. And again, there's a fairly consistent improvement um, across multiple randomized trials, but overall the improvement um, is relatively small. So 
across all studies mean improvement in 24 hour blood pressures, only about two millimeters of mercury. And for those of you who treat hypertension uh, on a daily basis, you'll recognize that this is a much smaller effect than what you can get with alternative treatments. So we're left with these key reasons to treat uh, obstructive sleep apnea. I think the biggest uh, reason is that we, we can improve symptoms. And so there's multiple randomized trials that show that you can improve sleep quality, daytime sleepiness, vitality, snoring, and secondarily, there's randomized trials that show that you improve partner sleep quality by treating sleep apnea. Now, there are no randomized trials showing you reduce uh, motor vehicle accident risk due to ethical reasons, but there are, there are well done, um, rigorous observational uh, pre-post studies that, that do show this. Um, the other reason is that we believe that there may be a benefit in terms of cardiovascular risk. This is primarily in those with severe obstructive sleep apnea as epidemiologic studies don't really show any association between mild sleep apnea um, and cardiovascular risk. Nevertheless, there, there are randomized trial data that show that there is this reduction in blood pressure, however small. And so there's been a lot of um, hope that, that treating sleep apnea might reduce things like stroke, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and coronary events. And so that gets us to this fundamental question of who should we be treating uh, for sleep apnea? We've seen that it's a highly prevalent disease. And are we really gonna to try to treat all 1 billion people in the world for sleep apnea? And so here are four options that, that I would pose to you. That um, should we be aiming to treat those with sleep apnea who are asking for treatment, those with sleep apnea who have symptoms, those with sleep apnea are at elevated cardiovascular risk regardless of symptoms, or, or should we be liberal and be really treating anybody who has an elevated AHI? So I'll start by saying, um, I would argue that currently what we're doing for the most part is, is treating those who are coming in asking for treatment. So I'll start by just showing you some data on how good a job we are doing in diagnosing sleep apnea. Um, I've been a part of the Hispanic Community Health Study where we've done portable sleep studies on 16,000 Hispanic Americans around the country. And when we limited our, our surveys to those who had moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, um, and we asked these individuals whether they had been clinically diagnosed with sleep apnea. We found that only 5% uh, of people had received a clinical diagnosis. Now, some of that may be due to the fact that there's a high level of uninsuredness uh, in, in this population, but we see similar data in the Wisconsin Sleep Court, which is a middle-aged uh, population of government workers. So these uh, patients all had um, uh, medical insurance. And in this population, you see that the percentage of patients who had a clinical diagnosis was fairly low as well. In this case, we're limiting it to people who uh, definitely had symptoms, so had obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And you can see that um, only 10% of men and 2% of women had a clinical diagnosis. And even if you limited it to moderate to severe sleep apnea syndrome, it was still only 18% of men and 7% of women. Um, so this study looked at primary care screening for obstructive sleep apnea. It was a study of five practice-based research networks across the country. And in interviewing primary care physicians, what they found was that 23% of physicians were routinely screening for sleep apnea in their practice, all using the review systems, which uh, seems fairly appropriate as a method for screening. And, and overall, the prevalence of sleep apnea diagnosed, uh, diagnosis in these patient panels was, was just under 9%. Um, these investigators then sat in the waiting room and, and, and interviewed patients who were waiting to see these primary care physicians who did not have a clinical sleep apnea diagnosis. And among those patients, they found that 50% reported that they had loud snoring, anywhere from a half to two thirds reported they had daytime tiredness. And somewhere between 10 and 20% reported that they were, had problems falling asleep while driving. Yet only about 20% of patients discussed their symptoms with their primary care doctor. Again, presumably, um, that 20% refre reflects the 23% of primary care doctors who were routinely asking. And so it's pretty clear that even though patients have a high prevalence of symptoms suggestive of sleep apnea, they don't offer these uh, problems up to their physicians unless they're specifically asked. Now, I was struck by the high prevalence of drowsy driving, 10 to 20% in a primary care clinic. So we decided to look at this using sort of national surveillance data, the CDC behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. And, and there was a question in that uh, survey that asked, during the past 30 days, have you ever nodded off or fallen asleep while driving? And what we found was the 30 day point prevalence of drowsy driving uh, was fairly high. Uh, you can see here about 3% of whites and over 6% of blacks and Hispanics. 
And so we were struck by the high prevalence of this nationally, as well as the fact that there were these large racial disparities where Blacks and Hispanics had more than double the rate of uh, drowsy driving. And in fact, uh, these racial disparities are apparent throughout sleep medicine. So these are data looking at um, the severity of disease at the time of clinical diagnosis. So in a study from an urban academic center in Detroit, what they found was um, blacks at the time of sleep apnea diagnosis had much more severe sleep apnea as based by the AHI, as well as much higher levels of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, suggesting that it was taking longer for black patients to get to uh, uh, the point of, of receiving a diagnosis compared to their white counterparts. And we've seen similar findings in uh, academic center in Cleveland, where just comparing black men to white men, again, we see that at the time of diagnosis, black men have much higher AHIs as well as much higher levels of obesity and hypertension. In addition, we looked at symptoms and you can see there's markedly elevated symptoms in black men at the time of diagnosis, both in terms of sleepiness with the upper sleepiness score, as well as drowsy driving problems, suggesting again that, that currently there are delays in, in blacks uh, getting to uh, clinical diagnosis. Now, looking at national level data and the prevalence of sleep apnea diagnosis, these are NHANES data uh, where they interviewed people and asked if they had been clinically diagnosed with sleep apnea. And overall, you can see the prevalence is 6% of men and 3% of women, much lower than epidemiologic surveys of what the true prevalence of sleep apnea syndrome is. Um, but you also see these disparities again, where, where whites are much more likely to have a clinical diagnosis than blacks and Mexican Americans, even though these latter groups have much higher levels of obesity and so have much higher risk of having sleep apnea. So let's go back to this question of who should be getting uh, evaluated and treated for sleep apnea. And um, going to this question of, should we be screening everybody with a sleep study to look for sleep apnea? The US Preventive Services Task Force just a few years ago in 2017 came out with a statement basically saying that the evidence is insufficient to, to give an answer to this question. And the reason for that is they did an in-depth literature search and they could find zero studies that evaluated the impact of screening and treatment in asymptomatic patients. And so I think at this point, there's really no evidence to suggest that we should be aggressively doing sleep studies on people uh, who don't have symptoms. So what about those who are at high cardiovascular risk? Um, there's been a lot of interest in trying to use sleep apnea as a way to, uh, as sort of a lever that you can intervene upon to reduce cardiovascular risk based uh, a lot on this study from 15 years ago, where they took patients who'd been presenting to a sleep clinic um, and then looked at separately those patients with severe sleep apnea who had declined CPAP use shown in this red line and those who had accepted CPAP in the blue line. And what they found over up to 12 years, sorry, was that um, the, the risk of fatal cardiovascular events was much higher in those who had severe sleep apnea and had declined CPAP use. And adjusting for uh, other cardiovascular risk factors, they found the risk of fatal cardiovascular events in those who declined CPAP was, was nearly threefold higher compared to those who accepted CPAP. And further, you can see that those who accepted CPAP had a risk that was similar to those with mild sleep apnea um, or even uh, no sleep apnea. And again, the mild sleep apneas did not have any elevated cardiovascular risk. So because of those observational studies, there've been a number of randomized trials done. This is the largest randomized trial done to date, the SAVE trial, which randomized 2,700 non-sleepy patients with obstructive sleep apnea as well as cardiovascular disease, randomized them to CPAP or usual care for a median of 3.7 years. And you can see on the cumulative incidence curves that, that, that these two curves overlap. And there's really no effect of CPAP therapy on cardiovascular endpoints in this randomized trial. Now, CPAP adherence was somewhat suboptimal at 3.3 hours per night. But again, um, from an intention to treat standpoint, there was really no evidence that uh, there's any benefit from treating uh, patients with CPAP therapy. We've done a meta-analysis looking at these randomized trials that have been published. And overall, you can see that all these randomized trials have been relatively negative. The overall hazard uh, risk ratio that we, we identified was 0.96. And even after this, um, there's been another trial just in the last year, the Isaac trial, which found, if anything, a trend towards a, a greater risk in those who are, who are assigned to CPAP with, with a risk ratio greater than one. So overall, the randomized trials really show no benefit from CPAP therapy. In contrast, when we look at the observational data, uh, 
what we see is that there's, there's much stronger evidence that there may be some benefit. And overall, there's a risk ratio of 0.46, suggesting you can uh, have the, the risk of cardiovascular events by putting people on CPAP. And so the question is, why is there such a big difference? And obviously, there, there are potential methodologic reasons in terms of why randomized trials give you a different answer. But in addition, I think there's been a lot of interest in, in looking at what were the differences in the populations that were studied. And I think the big difference is that the observational studies have assessed patients who presented to sleep clinic with symptoms, basically an obstructive sleep apnea syndrome uh, phenotype, while the randomized trials have recruited non-sleepy patients for ethical reasons, believing it wasn't ethical to randomize a sleepy patient to not getting CPAP for uh, three or more years. And so the question becomes, might sleep apnea itself be different from sleep apnea syndrome? And I'd, I, I would argue that there's at least three reasons why there might be a difference. So one is that the AHI may not be specific to the actual disease we're, we're interested in. Although apneas are very easy to score, if you talk to any sleep physician, hypopneas are, are, are a lot more squirrely. Um, the definition of a hypopnea changes uh, every few years as we try to de define what is physiologically significant. Um, and, and sort of that there's, there's some night-to-night -night variability in what the AHI is in a specific patient. And so when we have an uh, index that's not specific, from a Bayesian standpoint, if we add symptoms into the mix, we, we can be much more specific in identifying the disease that we're trying to treat. A second possibility is that sleepiness itself may identify an underlying susceptibility to the adverse effects of sleep apnea. To the extent that the damage from sleep apnea is caused by intermittent hypoxemia and sleep fragmentation, and these at a cellular level may increase oxidative stress. If that oxidative stress in the brain is what's causing the sleepiness, then individuals who are at higher risk of that oxidative stress damage, um, both in the brain and in the heart, may be the same ones who are, are also at elevated cardiovascular risk. And so the sleepiness may be in, uh, identifying the, the patient population who are going to be the most responsive to treatment. Um, finally, uh, a much more mundane answer may be that the symptomatic benefit from CPAP we know is a primary driver to reinforce ongoing adherence. And so the symptomatic patients may be the patients where you can get high enough adherence that you can get a benefit. And so there's some evidence to, to, to support these contentions. These are data from uh, observational study, the Sleep Heart Health Study, um, which is a community-based, uh, actually multiple NHLBI funded studies. And, and what these investigators did is they took patients with uh, moderate to severe sleep apnea and they did a cluster analysis based on symptoms to try to divide patients into different clusters. And you can see they identified four clusters. The green cluster is those who really had no symptoms. The blue line is those with disturbed sleep, meaning insomnia type symptoms. The pink line is those with moderate sleepiness. And then the red line is those with excessive sleepiness. And what they found in terms of incident cardiovascular disease was that three of these groups really had very similar risks and it was only those with excessive sleepiness who had the highest risk. The black line shows those who have no sleep apnea. And even though those, there, there seems to be this difference between those with no sleep apnea and these three other clusters, it turns out that this difference is really driven by demographic differences that um, patients with sleep apnea are older and have a higher BMI. And once you adjust for these risk factors, you can see these adjusted hazard ratios that these, other, these three clusters up at the top, if anything, are actually protected from cardiovascular disease. And it's really only those with excessive sleepiness who appear to be at higher uh, cardiovascular risk. And so it, it may make sense that this is the group we're going to benefit from a cardiovascular standpoint from treatment. And then again, the, these are data just showing that CPAP acceptance and long-term CPAP use really depends on the baseline level of sleepiness. And those who are not sleepy, the lowest upward score here, ha have the highest rate of discontinuing CPAP over time. So whatever the reason, I think there's enough clinical trials now to suggest that those patients who are asymptomatic um, are not going to benefit from uh, CPAP therapy. And so our, our focus then really should be on, on one of these. Um, and so now we're left with, what about those with sleep apnea and symptoms? Should we be actively seeking out symptoms? And so we did a study um, where we decided to screen sleep ap for sleep apnea in a high risk population. And we selected type two diabetes as a population that has a high risk of sleep apnea. There's been 
studies from the look ahead uh, trial that, that suggested that the prevalence of sleep apnea is very high up to 86%. And so we approached an academic primary care uh, clinic where they had a type two diabetes panel that they maintained for quality improvement reasons. And we decided to try to do a screening pilot program in that uh, population. And so first what we did is we asked those primary care uh, providers to review their patient list who had type two diabetes and exclude anyone who would be inappropriate for screening for sleep apnea. So anyone who already had known sleep apnea, obviously, and then anyone who had a significant uh, other uh, disease that, that would make um, trying to start sleep apnea inappropriate at that time. So people who are getting chemotherapy, patients who had dementia, things like that. Uh, and then amongst the remainder of patients, we screened them over the telephone with the stop bang um, it's an eight item validated screen. And so we screened uh, uh, 818 patients and found that 90% screened as high risk using the stop bang. Um, for those who screened positive, we, we proceeded to do a sleep study. And so assuming all those who had negative uh, stop bangs did not have sleep apnea, we ended up with an estimate of the sleep apnea prevalence being about 82%, very similar to what's been reported with that 86%. Um, at that point, we offered CPAP therapy, and what we found was that uh, two-thirds accepted CPAP therapy and one-third didn't. And when we looked at what predicted acceptance of CPAP therapy, severity of symptoms was uh, the strongest predictor of, of PAP adherence, or sorry, PAP acceptance, suggesting that, that we might have designed the study uh, more efficiently if we had used a, a screening tool that more heavily weighted symptoms rather than uh, demographic uh, uh, factors. Nevertheless, in those who accepted uh, PAP therapy, what we found was that there were significant improvements in sleepiness and sleep quality and, and in daytime functioning um, with CPAP therapy, suggesting that um, actively screening a high-risk population for symptoms um, can improve uh, quality of life in patients uh, with sleep apnea. So I would argue that what we should be doing is, is really uh, sort of using our resources to try to focus on patients who have sleep apnea and symptoms. Um, I, I think the work left to do here is we need practical ways to assess symptoms um, that, are, uh, that can be easily implemented into the busy clinical practices of primary care physicians. So I wanna, sorry, the one caveat I wanna point out is that there's some evidence that there, there are um, some patient populations who may benefit even without symptoms. And so this is a post hoc analysis of a clinical trial of CPAP therapy in patients with resistant hypertension. And so the original trial uh, recruited patients who had elevated blood pressure despite being on at least three meds uh, for their hypertension. They, they made sure that these patients were adherent with their medications. And when they did the randomized trial of CPAP or usual care, um, they, they found overall that the impact on blood pressure was fairly similar to what others had reported. But when they did this secondary analysis, they they stratified into those who were on three to four medications versus those who are on five or more medications, what's called refractory hypertension. And in that refractory hypertension group, what you can see is that the blood pressure improvement was, uh, was substantial compared to the control group, nine millimeter reduction in systolic and seven, milliliter, seven millimeters in diastolic. And given that these are patients who are already failing five medications, I think this is a large enough effect size to say that this may be a population um, that it may warrant to, to uh, screen for sleep apnea, even if they're relatively asymptomatic. Of note, adherence in this study was much higher than what's reported in other trials. I think primarily because they limited it to people who are adherent to multiple medic, uh, blood pressure meds. Anyway, let's switch gears now um, and talk about, now you have somebody who you think may have sleep apnea, how do we diagnose and initiate treatment? And the traditional sleep apnea care delivery pathway is, has been if you think somebody has sleep apnea, you send them to the sleep lab, do a sleep study. Um, then if that study is positive, you send them back to the lab for a second night and do a CPAP titration study where a technician slowly adjusts the pressure to find the right pressure to treat their sleep apnea. And then once you have those settings, you then initiate CPAP in the home with the home care company using those settings. The limitations of that traditional pathway are, are that in many markets, there's very long wait times because you're limited by the number of sleep beds. Um, it's also inconvenient to many patients, those with caregiver responsibilities who can't really uh, leave their family members home alone at night, those with atypical sleep schedules who don't sleep at night when the sleep lab's open, and then marginalized groups. And I think this is underestimated a little bit, but for many people to come and sleep in the sleep lab uh, 
and have a strange person watching you um, in a vulnerable state like that can really be threatening. And so there's been a lot of technological advances to, to try to say, maybe we don't need to do this sort of deluxe testing when all we really care about is the respiratory channels to say, does somebody have sleep apnea or not? And you can see here, uh, these sort of home sleep tests that have just a few channels here, this device just has nasal cannula to measure airflow, a band around the chest to measure respiratory effort and oximeter on the finger, um, becomes simple enough that the patient can put on in the comfort of their own home. In addition with that technological advance has been the development of auto titrating CPAP or APAP. And this is basically a device that measures flow or impedance depending on the brand and adjusts the pressure up or down based on the flow signal it's getting to keep the airway open. And this was originally developed to try to lower the pressure over the course of the night to make it more comfortable for patients. It turns out that that's not a main driver of adherence. But what this does uh, do is, is it means that you don't really need to spend the night in the sleep lab having a technician manually adjust. The machine can do it all by itself. And so this is a meta-analysis comparing the effectiveness of APAP versus CPAP in treating sleep apnea. Overall compliance improved by 11 minutes with APAP. Um, the upward score goes down by half a point. These are not clinically important differences, but they do sort of show that there's no downside really of APAP compared to fixed CPAP. And so then if we have uh, this simplified home sleep testing pathway where if you think somebody has sleep apnea, you order a home test. If the test is positive, you prescribe APAP with the same uh, uh, sort of dose for every patient, a wide range, five to 20 centimeters of water. This sort of simplified pathway re increases access, reduces burden on patients, and it also makes the diagnosis and treatment easier and um, something that a non-specialist can do. So there's been multiple randomized trials. There are five randomized trials um, following patients out to 90 days um, across three continents, um, Europe, Asia, North America, and both the VA settings as well as sort of uh, uh, academic settings. And all of these studies and all of these settings show that there's no difference in CPAP adherence, no difference in sleepiness, no difference in quality of life between a home-based pathway and a lab-based pathway. In addition, um, when you look at patient preference and crossover studies, a Canadian study where patients had to go through both treatment options, 76% preferred home over lab pathway. In a study of, of uh, uh, urban blacks in, in Chicago, comparing uh, just the diagnostic portion of home testing versus lab testing, 82% uh, preferred home testing. Um, so patients tend to prefer home testing. If you look at costs, there's anywhere from 25 to 50% cost savings from not having to go into the lab. And then obviously in the era of COVID, you also have decreased uh, risk of, of um, this whole pathway if you can uh, deliver this care in the home. So the limitations, um, all of these studies that I've shown you excluded those who are at high risk for alternative forms of sleep disorder breathing. Really the portable tests have been developed to try to distinguish obstructive sleep apnea from no sleep disorder breathing. They haven't really been tested rigorously to see if they can distinguish different types of sleep disorder breathing. Um, so the role, of, the role of home testing in those patients who are at high risk for multiple forms of sleep disorder breathing is unclear. Nevertheless, in limited resource settings, there are a lot of case series showing that these devices can be used even in the setting of heart failure. All right, so I want to shift gears again and say now you have a patient on CPAP, how do you maximize PAP adherence? Um, this is you know, much of what the specialty of sleep medicine focuses on, and so I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail about this, but really come up with some simple um, take home messages for a primary care audience. Um, I think there's been a lot of work by the CPAP industry to try to say we can add more bells and whistles to our CPAP machine to try to make it more comfortable for the patient. Um, for, the post, for the most part, this is just a lot of sales hype um, and there really isn't strong evidence to suggest that um, adding features to a machine makes it more comfortable. Um, the one exception is really looking at the mask. So when CPAP was first invented, um, it was delivered through a nasal mask as shown here, a, a mask that covers the nose and applies the pressure purely on the nose. Subsequently, there's been development of these other mask tiles. This nasal pillows interface is one that goes in the nostril. Um, it can minimize claustrophobia and make it easier for patients who like to sleep with their glasses on because they read or watch TV in bed. Um, but then also there's this development of these full face masks that cover the nose and mouth in order to help patients who had significant nasal pathology, who had uh, severe nasal uh, septal deviation, 
or other reasons that they couldn't breathe through their nose and were really obligate mouth breathers. Um, unfortunately, these full face masks have increased in, in use over time, I think in part because respiratory therapists have, who are trained on the inpatient side are, are used to these full face masks much more for treating uh, respiratory failure in, in the acute setting. And so tend to become more familiar with these types of masks. Um, there have been several randomized trials. This was a well done study, which uh, was a crossover trial comparing the use of a nasal mask to a full face mask. Um, and what you can see over four weeks is that uh, when the patients were on the nasal mask, they had uh, significantly higher adherence one hour more per night and their sleepiness was significantly less. In addition, when we, they asked patients about their preference, 95% preferred the nasal mask over the full face mask, um, suggesting that the nasal mask um, should be the preferred option. Um, there's been a lot of case series um, of patients who fail full face mask and then who do much better with the nasal mask. There have also been these sort of uh, registry studies. This is the largest study published from France, 2,300 patients. You can see in um, this registry, the prevalence of full face masks is, is fairly high, 20, over 25%. Um, even though when they looked at adherence again, you see significantly lower adherence in patients who are on full face masks compared to the two nasal styles. And in fact, after adjusting for severity of disease, the odds ratio for non-adherence if you have a full face mask is twice as high as the other mask styles. Um, physician specialty groups have, have been fairly unanimous in, in this. The American Thoracic Society just a few months ago released a statement. Although mouth breathing is common among sleep apnea patients, a nasal mask is usually the best option. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine came out with this statement that I helped write that nasal or intranasal, meaning nasal pillow interfaces are maybe preferred over full face masks for routine initiation of PAP therapy. Just despite all of this, full face masks remain um, highly prevalent and, and a large market share of um, patients who are getting started on sleep apnea. And, and a big reason for that is oftentimes physicians don't specify what mask when they order a CPAP machine. Um, and if you don't order, if you don't specify what kind of mask you want, you leave it to the home care company. And the home care company has an incentive to put patients on full face masks. <clears throat> this is the uh, reimbursement rates in 2020 in the Pittsburgh area. In Seattle, it'll be a little bit higher, but, but the relative rates are the same, that um, patients, uh, that, that home care companies will make nearly 50% more money if they set a patient up on a full face mask rather than a nasal mask. So just a simple thing you can do is, is try not to, uh, try to prevent this by, by specifying you want a nasal mask for your patient. The, the other thing that has been shown in, in a lot of studies to improve long-term adherence are behavioral interventions to increase the motivation of patients to use their CPAP. So this is a meta-analysis of various behavioral interventions. And you can see, depending on the intensity of the treatment, you get different effect sizes. But overall, this meta-analysis suggested large effect size over an hour a, a night in, in CPAP adherence with the behavioral intervention. We did a trial where we randomized 83 patients to uh, PAP alone or PAP plus a motivational enhancement intervention, where we gave two face-to-face -face interventions the first week of starting CPAP, and then five phone calls over the next six months. And what we found was adherence was 1.1 hours uh, per night higher at six months in those who had gotten the motivational enhancement, um, showing that these interventions um, can work to increase adherence. And that persisted out to a year. Um, one of the key parts to, to behavioral interventions is self-monitoring. If the patient know how they're doing, um, that gives them reinforcement um, to, to keep um, with high adherence. So this is a trial from the University of Pennsylvania where they took newly diagnosed sleep apnea patients getting started on CPAP, randomized them to usual care uh, or usual care with web access where they could log in and see how much they had used their CPAP the previous night or that web access plus a financial incentive. And you can see at one week, there was marked improvements over one and a half hours increased adherence if patients were seeing um, and getting feedback on how much they were using their CPAP. And at three months, that difference persisted. Interestingly, there was no added benefit from, from paying them cash on top of that. So the question becomes, um, from, from an implementation standpoint, how, how do we deliver these sort of behavioral interventions um, when there's little time and, and reimbursement for them? And I think the most practical thing at this point is that all of the PAP manufacturers now have mobile apps that are free for patients to download and use. 
And what these apps do is they certainly allow for um, self-monitoring. All of these apps provide the patient each morning uh, feedback on how much they use their CPAP. You can see this app here shows hours of use of therapy, how good their mask fit was and what their residual AHI was, how well treated their sleep apnea was to give them uh, feedback. In addition, there's different modules here. You can see there's sort of a, a motivational enhancement goal where, where uh, the patient can set their own goal. Here they could set a goal saying that they wanted to use their CPAP 11 days in a row and it shows them how close they are to reaching that goal. And then when they reach that goal, they get a little virtual trophy. Um, on top of that, there, there are videos for education so that the patient can get immediate um, answers to, my mask is not fitting right, what can I do? And there's a video to show you how to fit your mask properly or how to clean um, uh, your device or take care of it. Um, so there's been some retrospective analyses from two different CPAP manufacturers looking at how well um, adherence is improved in patients who use their app. So they compared those who downloaded the app to those who didn't download the app. And you can see in this study, adherence was 1.4 hours higher. And in this, in this study, it was one hour higher. Um, these are not randomized trials. So, so there certainly may be biases in who downloads the app and who doesn't. But given that this is a free, uh, uh, free intervention, it really doesn't cost anything. It seems um, silly not to encourage patients to use this. So just to summarize, hopefully um, I've tried to convince you that obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is a common yet underdiagnosed disease. And a lot of that is due to the fact that there's lack of conversations happening between clinicians and patients about sleep. Um, the group that's most likely to benefit from diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea are those who have symptoms. And so we should really be focusing resources on those who are symptomatic. Um, Third, a clinical pathway using home testing and then home treatment with APAP is fairly simple for primary care physicians to initiate. And then finally, um, despite the nihilism out there, PAP is tolerated by the majority of patients and can be enhanced by some simple interventions like actively avoiding full face masks, encouraging use of uh, mobile apps. So just to go back to the clinical cases, uh, reminding you that first case was an asymptomatic man who incidentally found he had a high AHI. Um, he had no symptoms that you could really improve on. And given multiple randomized trials showing there's no evidence cardiovascular risk will improve with uh, direct treatment of the sleep apnea, my suggestion would be that the best thing to do with this patient would be to counsel him on evidence-based weight loss interventions, advising him that losing weight would not only lower his AHI, but it would also lower his cardiovascular risk. For the second patient, the woman with the low back pain, I think it's obviously you wanna address the pain, but in addition, I think you wanna take those cues to, to search a little bit more and get some more history about the motor vehicle crash you'd been in to, to see if there was any drowsy driving, screening for sleep apnea symptoms, and then if she does have symptoms, um, to order a home sleep test and, and initiate treatment. So why don't I stop there and, and I'd, have, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. We actually do have a couple questions for you. Um, the first is uh, interested in your thoughts on the Epworth um, as the best way to screen. And particularly, what about those patients who've never had a quote unquote good sleep and they don't know what feeling rested actually feels like, particularly those who never actually realize they have a sleepiness problem? Yeah, so um, certainly I, I don't, um, I, I think there are better metrics to use than the Epworth sleepiness score. We, we've played around with the, um, there's some sleep scales developed by the NIH as part of this PROMISE initiative. And there's some short forms with the PROMISE um, uh, sleep scales that I think we found to be much more useful than the Epworth sleepiness score. Um, but, but I do think that it's important to distinguish fatigue from sleepiness, because I think there's strong evidence that sleepiness gets better. The, you know, if somebody's saying that I fall asleep when I'm just sitting there or when I'm go to a movie or, or listen to my child's, you know, concert um, and the lights go down, that those symptoms will get better with treatment as opposed to fatigue and, and feeling unrested. And so I think we need to be a little bit careful that um, those fatigue symptoms, um, you know, that, that may be unnecessarily spending a lot of time doing sleep studies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question um, pertaining to the use of mobile apps and big data. With the increasing use, do you see a role for 
um, AI in a population-based approach? Um, I guess in, in terms of um, identifying patients, I, I guess, um, I, I think there's, a, so number one, I guess there's a lot of um, apps out there that are being developed to, to screen for sleep apnea um, with these physiologic monitors, just as there is in atrial fibrillation and a lot of other conditions. And I think there's a lot of concern that we're gonna be finding a lot of asymptomatic people who really probably won't benefit from treatment. Um, and so we need to be, be completely clear on, on which patients are going to benefit from treatment. So we're not spending um, money unnecessarily on those patients. From, from an AI, I, I guess from uh, the app standpoint and monitoring patients, the patients who are on CPAP, we, we have a wealth of data that we can follow. There's, we can measure night to night their, their breathing. And there's a lot of opportunities to potentially use AI to try to see if we can detect patterns to say, is this person um, going to become non-adherent? And so we have a, a window of opportunity to bring them in and try to give them some motivational enhancement or with more complex disease to say that they're going to have an exacerbation if they have comorbid COPD or heart failure. And I think there's a lot of interest in trying to, to use AI or machine learning to identify those patients. I think like a lot of things, because there's biases in who gets treated, you have to be careful um, that we don't reinforce those biases with um, AI. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, the questions keep rolling in, so I'll just keep going through those. Um, there's another question for uh, talking about that population of patients who can just not tolerate CPAP or just don't want it. What uh, can we offer patients, particularly for, their, for those primary care providers who might be seeing them more often? Yeah, so I think the, the, there's now some comparative effectiveness trials showing that mandibular advancement devices made by a dentist, hopefully one who's trained in sleep, um, have outcomes that are um, fairly similar to CPAP. Um, adherence is, well, so the effectiveness in lowering the AHI with these mandibular advancement devices is um, somewhat less than with CPAP, but adherence is, is much higher because they're more acceptable to patients. And so um, there's a comparative effectiveness trial a few years ago showing sleepiness is actually similar whether you get CPAP or one of these dental appliances. And so I think that really is the second line option. Um, there are surgical treatments that are, that are emerging as a, sort of a third line option. Hypoglossal nerve stimulation um, is, is one of the biggest. Um, so, so there are other options that um, patients can try if either they can't tolerate CPAP or, or it just doesn't fit with their lifestyle. Um, one treatment that I think I would ask, uh, I would suggest that there isn't much evidence to, to use is oxygen. Um, we did a trial where, where we randomized patients to CPAP, oxygen, or no treatment. And we were able to show that there was a blood pressure reduction with CPAP, but no blood pressure reduction with oxygen, even though we eliminated the nocturnal desaturations. Um, that's not covered by, by private insurance anyway, but um, we still see a lot of patients get put on oxygen. Um, and I think dental appliances are, are a better option. Another um, question, particularly in the primary care setting, um, is there any evidence that patient reported symptoms are less than partner reported symptoms, i.e. Uh, is one versus the other better to use when assessing, assessing symptoms in the office? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's one that we need a lot more research on. I, I think the, the truth is that the decision to use CPAP in a lot of ways is, is a couple's decision. Um, one, of the big, one of the biggest drivers on whether patients accept CPAP or not is, is what their partner thinks of it. And so, um, you know, one of the big challenges is sort of trying to get at um, what the partner is going to think about it. And, and one of the nice things about telemedicine in the era of COVID is that it's much easier to have these visits with um, both the patient and their partner. In terms of whose symptoms, I think, you know, I think anyone who's practiced Lee Medicine will, will tell you that a lot of men will sort of underreport their symptoms and it's their wife who, who brings them in and says, no, you do snore, you do fall asleep all the time. Everyone knows you fall asleep, stop saying you're not sleepy. Um, and so I, I think there is some, um, you know, that there is utility in getting the partners 
um, reports as well. A lot of the sleep issues are, are going to be unknown to the patient because they're unconscious when they're asleep. There's a question about uh, your one of your cases, actually. So in the second patient with back pain raises the question of OSA increasing pain, especially with fibromyalgia. And they're wondering if you have any comments or thoughts on that. Yeah, there's there's I mean, I think there's there's pathway suggested that certainly poor sleep can increase pain sensitivity. Um, and, and there's some work to suggest that sleep apnea can um, impact um, pain sensitivity in, in the perioperative setting after um, surgery. Um, so, so there's certainly a reason to think about this. I don't think there's any high quality uh, data to show that treating sleep apnea improves outcomes in a fibromyalgia population. Um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, clinics that send fibromyalgia patients for sleep evaluation. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know that we have strong evidence to suggest that, that there's a lot of good that comes from um, aggressive sleep apnea treatment, but it's certainly worthy of further study. Yeah. And then there's a question of um, when insomnia is the primary symptom in a patient with other OSA risk factors, how much or how often does the symptom improve with OSA treatment? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, there, there's um, sort of a, lo a large registry data from, from Iceland um, looking at patients over time and what their presenting symptoms were and how well they did with treatment uh, with CPAP. And I, I think what's important to note is what, that, what they found is that you need to really think, divide up insomnia into sleep onset insomnia, patients who are having a lot of trouble falling asleep versus those who have more trouble staying asleep or waking up through the night. And sleep apnea treatment will um, improve that sort of nocturnal awakenings type symptoms. And those patients tend to be uh, highly adherent because they gain benefit. While patients who have sleep onset insomnia where they can't fall asleep, um, not only do, do those symptoms not get better with CPAP therapy, but that insomnia is a strong predictor that they're not gonna be adherent to CPAP. Um, I, I think it makes sense that if you are struggling to fall asleep, trying to fall asleep with the mask on your face is gonna be even harder. Um, and so I think it makes much more sense to try to focus on treating the insomnia through evidence-based strategies for insomnia therapy. And there's even a new, uh, a recent trial from Australia showing that treating the insomnia actually improves the AHI, um, likely by changing the arousal threshold in these patients. Very incredibly interesting. Um, there's another question of if you could comment on your thoughts on the sleep apnea endotypes and if relevant to clinical practice in terms of the future of precision medicine. Yeah, um, great question. I, th I think it's way too early to say. Um, all of these studies focus on endotypes. My big critique of that, so this is trying to look at the physiologic pathways that lead to sleep apnea. Um, and, and there's a lot of work showing that there are these different um, physiologic pathways that can lead to sleep apnea as defined by an elevated AHI. Unfortunately, um, none of these folks who've done these measurements have actually assessed symptoms. And so if our focus on treating sleep apnea is to make symptoms better, we don't know whether there's uh, differences in, um, you know, in endotypes or whether a uh, strategy of focusing on endotypes will improve symptoms. And so I, I think the investigators focusing on these endotypes recognize this deficiency and are starting to do trials where they're actually assessing symptoms. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll know this. Well, I think, I think that's a great way uh, to end. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time. And it was really a fantastic talk and really applicable to, to all the folks from primary care through those interested in sleep medicine. So really appreciate you coming to give this talk and, and full of really great information. So thank you and, and much appreciated. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see folks back next week for our next Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and have a great Friday, everybody.